Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eileen Strumpel, and it is my pleasure and honor to serve as the inaugural dean here at the Herb Alpert School of Music. I thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, and I just want to start out by quietly noting to everyone um, and acknowledging the pattern of violence against Asian and Asian Americans um, that's happened this week in Atlanta and is just um, a signifier of a lot of the violence that um, has happened against our Asian and Pacific Islander colleagues. Um, but we stand together in declaring um, that this is not going to be tolerated in our school or our community, and we stand in solidarity with you. Um, and uh, in the eloquent words of uh, my colleague Arturo O'Farrell, following the simple tenet of treating one another as we wish to be treated. Um, so with that humble acknowledgement, it's actually in a certain sense why this series exists. The title is still waiting because we are still waiting. Um, the last years have per perhaps been some of the most complex, challenging, um, hatred-filled years. And um, the culmination, uh, not only in, in what I really think of as a twin pandemic, both of uh, COVID-19 and then in the racial reckoning that has happened in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, has really crystallized into this, this moment when we realize we are still waiting, that idealized world um, that we, we might have uh, hoped for, longed for, um, won't magically happen without us having these critical conversations and without taking action. And um, I want to thank uh, my wonderful colleague, Arturo O'Farrell, our Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion for helping to lead in conjunction with our Anti-Racism Action Committee, these conversations and action plans uh, for us as a school and look forward to the continued transformation that we as a community insist upon. Um, and what a wonderful way to set the stage for this afternoon's very special conversation with our dear friend, Simon Woods. Um, without any further ado, I um, just personally want to thank Simon as a, as a dear friend and colleague for, for, for joining um, in his new role. Um, he really has an, a national uh, perspective on, um, on this particular moment and as it, how it intersects with um, institutions like ours of the Herb Alpert School of Music um, and the American Symphony Orchestra are largely drawn based large, both of these are based on a Western European high art classical music tradition at their at their core most foundations. And so then in this moment when we are still waiting, when we are looking for transformation, in this backdrop on in these contexts, how do we evoke change? Um, and so with those kind of burning questions, I put forth um, uh, an invitation to all of you to open your minds, your ears, your hearts, and join in today's conversation. And um, I'd like to invite Neil Stolberg, my colleague uh, and our director of orchestra here at the Herb Alpert School of Music at UCLA to offer an introduction to our special guest this afternoon. Neil. Thank you, Dean Strempel, and good afternoon to everyone. It's my great pleasure today to welcome our guest, Simon Woods. Simon Woods is one of our country's most thoughtful and experienced orchestra administrators. He has served as the chief executive officer of the Los Angeles Philharmonic, the Seattle Symphony, the Royal Scottish National Orchestra, and the New Jersey Symphony, and prior to that, as Vice President of Artistic Planning and Operations with the Philadelphia Orchestra. He spent many years as a classical CD producer at EMI Classics in London. He holds a BA in music from the University of Cambridge in England and a diploma in conducting from the Guildhall School of Music in London. And we count him at our School of Music as, let's say, quote unquote, Bruin adjacent, a good friend and colleague. This fall, Simon began his tenure as president of the League of American Orchestras, North America's main service and advocacy organization for American symphony orchestras from 
the volunteer, community, and youth orchestras to the major professional orchestras. Like all of us who care so deeply about the future vitality and validity of this art form, the League is very, very fortunate to have him as its leader during such an existentially challenging time. Following Simon's presentation, we will have a Q&A session moderated by UCLA Professor of Global Jazz Studies and School of Music Associate Dean for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion and recent Grammy Award winner, Arturo O'Farrell. We hope that uh, our students who are in attendance today in particular uh, will participate in this discussion uh, actively. This is your chance to go behind the scenes and ask the tough questions. The title of Simon Woods's talk today is American Orchestras, Acknowledging Racism and Working for Change. On behalf of all of us today, welcome to Simon Woods. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Neil. Uh, thank you very much, Dean Strample. Thank you for welcoming me. Um, wow, brewing adjacent. I am. I am. Uh, I'm honoured. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm, I'm really to be happy to be here in this great community, um, great school, great university, and I couldn't be more honoured to be here today to speak to you. Um, and I'm glad that Dean Strample started um, with this, uh, you know, moment of recognition towards our um, Asian and Pacific Islander friends. Because, and it's, it's topical for me because actually just this afternoon before coming to this meeting, um, we have been crafting a message from the League of American Orchestras as a message from solidarity with AAPI communities. And you'll see that tomorrow. Um, that'll be on Facebook and on the website and in all the normal places tomorrow. And uh, we feel that pain very deeply. Um, and we feel all the pain around racism very deeply. Uh, this is an extraordinary, um, complicated moment for American orchestras. And uh, we, we're gonna talk about, a little bit about that today and about what's happening, what's going on. But I wanna start with a kind of a, a, a personal um, disclaimer as it, well, as it, as you, uh, if you will, because it's it's hard to um, uh, start a conversation like this without recognizing myself that I am a white male of relative privilege, um, and uh, there's all sorts of question marks in my mind about why am I a person making a a presentation about racism in American orchestras, um, recognizing that that many of you listening here. Uh, will have a lived experience that is different to mine and that tells you far more about this work than I do, than I can ever tell you. And I can only tell you that my own personal journey here um, leads me um, to a place, has led me, I would say, to a place of being deeply attached to the importance of this work and to the prospect of change in our field and to the prospect of greater inclusion and welcoming everyone. And I'll, and I'll come back to that prospect right at the very end of this talk. Uh, my own personal journey, you know, I, I think back to my you know, career in the record business and then moving to the US in 1997 to work for the Philadelphia Orchestra and realizing um, just how absolutely ignorant I was about this um, situation we have in orchestras and that we've, we've tolerated for far too long. And it wasn't really until I came back uh, in the around right about 2010, 2010, 11 to run the Seattle Symphony. And as we first started talking about social justice and its impact on our work there in Seattle, which is a very you know, socially oriented city. Um, and I suddenly realized how difficult these conversations were, but how important they were. And I would say that over the past decade, I have become really an, an, uh, an, a great advocate for this work. And, and you know, I, I, I came to the League of American Orchestras last September, knowing that this would be one of the richest and most important areas of work that I would take on leadership of. Um, and actually, this talk is an interesting moment for me because it has been an, an opportunity for me for me to kind of, um, if you like, bring together my thoughts about where we are and where we need to go. So I'm so uh, you are in a way somewhat um, guinea pigs today, and I hope you'll forgive me uh, for that. But I'm going to share some some thoughts, but I'm going to share them also recognizing a lot of humility, aware of um, 
my bias that I almost certainly bring that I'm not aware of, and my definite experience to continue to learn personally on this journey, because that is ultimately what this is all about. It is a journey and we're all permanently learning. So what I'm gonna do um, is I'm gonna share my screen and uh, I'm gonna take you through some slides and it's gonna be a bit kind of, let's call it a bit lecture format because I do wanna talk about some history. I wanna talk about where we've come from, partly because I think it's pretty revelatory and if you didn't know it, it's important to know it. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the field's doing right now. Um, and there's good news and there's, there's bad news. The bad news is the progress has been too slow and it's too late. The good news is things are actually happening and I'm gonna share some of that with you now and we can talk about what the future looks like. So let me uh, share my screen here and then we'll start um, going into some uh, things here. I'm just going to rearrange something on my screen. Right, there we go. So um, let's, um, this, this, is what I'm gonna, this is what I'm gonna talk about, a little bit of history, I want to talk about the pivotal moment of 2020 and why it was so important for orchestras. Talk about what the league's doing, talk about what orchestras are doing, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. So that's a quick summary. Let's start here. So last August, the, the league issued, League of American Orchestras issued its own statement um, on, um, about racism in American orchestras. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But I'm going to start here because at the same time, we also published this article about the history of racism in American orchestras by Aaron Flagg, who's chair and associate director, director of Juilliard, Juilliard Jazz. Aaron is terrific. I mean, he's a real leader. Um, and he's a leader, and he's also a board member of the League of American Orchestras. And as part of his role as a board member, he uh, offered very generously to write a detailed article um, talking about the history um, of racism in, in American orchestras. And I'm actually, as I go, I'm going to drop a few um, things in the chat here. I think I can do that. I think I can. Oh, if I can do that. Maybe I can't do that. Hmm. I don't see how to do that here. Okay, we might have to do this later. Um, but um, this is a very important article. You can go to our website. We'll, set, we'll send all the links later, later and I recommend you read it. And um, let's just go, first of all, to, I made a little su summary slide, which we'll come to in a second. But first of all, this is a big question he asks. He says, in 2020, are the musicians, staff, and board roles equally accessible to everyone interested in this music? Sadly, the simple answer is no. Why is that uncelebrated history of minority artistry? a culture in the field that is indifferent to the inequity, racial bias and microaggressions within it, and ignorance of the history of discrimination and racism against classical musicians of African-American Latinx heritage. And I'll, and I'll um, just you know, caveat, remember the title to this article, which was in response to the very particular moment about the, the killing of George Floyd. And the, the title of the article is Anti-Black Discrimination in American Orchestra. So just, you know, flagging here, it's in a sense an incomplete picture, but nonetheless an important one. So here's a, a, a slide, which is rather small type, but hopefully you can use it, you can, you can see it. And I'm not gonna go through it um, point by point, but the point here is to recognize the historical, systematic, intentional exclusion of black musicians in American musical life. Black musicians were not allowed to join the white unions and were treated as competitors. Uh, 1886, Walter, the black violinist, joined the otherwise all white New York musicians union and started um, the beginning of the process of integration, but it took 88 years to get that to a place that we might recognize today. Um, in that, then we have the, the, the Supreme Court um, decision in, 18, in the 1890s, separate but equal. And it's not really until we get to the late 80s that we begin to see. Sorry, mate, I just got a small technical problem here. Something is not working. I guess that's 
forgive me just one second. There we go, it's gone. Um, it's not really until we get to the late 80s that, 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 that there is really begins to be changed. And it's worth noting this little, this little line from 1958. Minutes from the New York Philharmonic's November 24 board meeting. In the past 10 years, not one Negro has showed up for a Philharmonic audition. And, you know, one, one wonders why they were surprised. So this is the, the, there's way more to read about this, and it's fascinating, and it's also extremely disturbing, but it's important to understand the context. So let's um, look at something else here. This is a, 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 a graph that shows um, a timeline of orchestra fellowship programs for African-American and Latino musicians. And it started actually, the most visionary program here started actually back in the 1970s by the LA Philharmonic, started by Zubin Mehta when he was music director of the orchestra. And then we see other orchestras beginning to develop these programs and they continue to today. But the reality is almost no impact. So why is that? Why is there almost no impact? It's because racism continued discrimination and separation continue. Um, and, you know, our field has been continuing this work, which is good and important, but it's not enough. Um, and that's why things are now happening that are very different. Let's look at another um, graph here. This is an interesting one as well. So the blue, the small shaded blue at the top shows, you probably can't see these numbers, but it shows from, I think, um, let's go back to that. Uh, I think it's 1980, that number at the top, the top left, right up to 2014. And you can see the dark blue representing the changes as non-white identifying musicians come into American orchestras. But then look down at the bottom and you see what's really going on there. Huge growth in Asian and Pacific Islander musicians and nothing in Hispanic, Latino and African-American musicians. So, you know, 2002, African-American musicians, 1.7% in American orchestras. 2014, African-Americans, 1.8% in American orchestras. I mean, that is a shocking indictment of a lack of change. Um, and lack of will to change. And it's also worth pointing out a topic that, you know, we can maybe come back to later. It's also worth talking about in, the, in this whole period. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about blind auditions and, you know, you look at the change in gender representation in American orchestras and see how dramatically that has changed. And we are not complete parity, but it's last time I looked 48, 51, kind of 49, 51. So there's, so there's been an extraordinary change in the gender makeup America of American orchestras, but almost none in the racial makeup. Very salutary um, and sobering to see those kind of numbers. So then, um, you know, just jumping back, looking at this 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 item here, late late nineteen eighties, uh, Detroit Symphony, um, suddenly under pressure, change begins to happen, um, and let's think about what's happening from from the nineteen nineties onwards. And there's no question that uh, there was a new urgency starting there. Now, I came to the U.S. in ninety seven, and when I arrived at the Philadelphia Orchestra in ninety seven. Um, there was a lot of talk. Uh, there was a diversity committee. Um, there were some concerts in black churches, uh, but there was almost no understanding of how one needed to change repertoire other than on Martin Luther King Day. Um, and there was almost no understanding of the urgency around changing the makeup of musicians on, on stage. And I wanna just like, I, I put the word diversity here in, in, in quote marks, because I, I wanna just kind of flag the, that word and how problematic that word is. You know, that's a word that wasn't right then in the nineties, it was the only word. We really did not talk then about equity and inclusion. There was no EDI, there was no equity, diversity, inclusion and, and ideas. There was, there, was, there was belonging, all of those things that we are familiar with now, they didn't exist and it was diversity. It was very othering. It was very notion of, you know, what we what we wanted to do, you know, what we wanted to do to change the makeup of our organizations without really thinking about 
um, the impact of the people who would be coming into our organizations without really thinking about cultural change. It was, it was largely tokenistic, to be, to be honest. And then I think, you know, we start to see a lot of external pressures. Um, orchestras suddenly have real urgency. Foundations start saying, mm, you know, need to change this if you want money from us. Same with government. Um, so there's the beginning of the of, of urgency. And there's, and yeah, as I look at this period, and, and, and I, I, I need, I think we need to do a bit more research about and, and catalog what actually changed between 1990 and 2020. Because actually, if you look back at the data, and you look back at that graph, which shows how little change there was. The reason I don't have many bullets here about the change that happened in that period was actually there was not much change happening. We were talking about it a lot, but not much was happening. Um, though I will draw your attention to one thing that happened, which was really important, which was 1997, the first Sphinx competition. And Sphinx, of course, as we all know, has gone on to be a powerhouse in this field. Aaron Dworkin, uh, Alpha Dworkin are great friends of the League of American Orchestras. They're great friends of, um, uh, of the orchestra field, and they should be great friends of anybody who cares about music, frankly. They're just wonderful people, and the work they've done has been visionary. So let's now jump on to 2018, recognizing that there's this gap. We should catalog it, but I don't think a lot has been happening. So uh, April 2018, the League of American Orchestra, the Sphinx organization, the New World Symphony announced the establishment of the National Alliance for Audition Support. Really a pivotal moment. I'm going to come to that in a minute. Uh, also in 2018, thanks to a multi-million dollar grant from the Mellon Foundation, the League lost, launched the Catalyst Fund, uh, which is about getting money into the hands of orchestras to create change. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment too. Uh, the board around the same time, the league's board of directors, we embraced and already exceeded a 25% diversity recruitment goal. And the, the league's board is currently about 30% um, non-white. And I will tell you, that's two things. First of all, it's not enough. Secondly, uh, it is more than most orchestras. And, um, you know, so to the extent that we see at the league, one of the roles of modeling change, um, we feel good about that number where we are, and we're setting some pretty adventurous goals for how that number is going to continue to, to go up. So in other words, we had started working on some fairly major substantial elements of change, including a major statement of commitment to racial equity. And then 2020 happened, pandemic happened, um, and uh, we heard uh, you know, horrendous stories um, of absolute merciless killing of black people, in, including, of course, and culminating with George Floyd. And that spurred a, a moment of change in our field, which I think will go down in history as the moment the field changed. And that sounds like a big statement, but I actually believe it. Because I think that what happened was uh, that orchestras suddenly realized this is real. Um, that our history is not something that we can be proud of, but our future needs to be different. And so the League, um, in August 2020, we issued our own statement on racial discrimination. I'm just going to read this one paragraph here because the whole statement, again, I'll send you the links later, the whole, the whole statement is, is interesting. But And by the way, I will just say, I want to just clarify, a lot of this happened before I joined the League in, in September of last year. So there's a lot of, I give a lot of credit to other, other, other people, other voices here. So this paragraph, which is the paragraph in last print, large print, which bears reading out, the League of American Orchestras acknowledges, accepts responsibility for and apologizes for the role it has played in perpetuating, excusing and participating in systemic discrimination based on race within the orchestra field. I think those words have some weight and um, the word of uh, apologizes was a, was, a, was a word I understand that, that had a lot of discussion um, at the time before the statement was made, but what an important word that is, because unless we can acknowledge the past and the failures of the past um, and apologize for it, how can we move forward? So this was definitely a pivotal moment for our organization. And we made a bunch of commitments about what we're going to do in the future. And I'm not gonna dwell on those now, except 
to say that they're there again on our website if you want to read them. Um, and, and we are currently in the middle of developing a pretty big plan about what's, what comes next. Okay, so then we followed it up with, a, with another document. This came out just a matter of weeks ago, making the case for equity, diversity, inclusion and orchestras. And you might think, why do we need to make the case? After everything that's happened, why do we, need, why do we still need to make the case? And um, I would tell you a couple of things about that. First of all, it's very important that we don't just stay in our bubble in our coastal orchestras. Um, and we have to remember, and you know, for all those of you who are students who are thinking about going out into the, into the profession, you may find yourself in communities which are very different to Los Angeles or very different to New York or, or Brooklyn or Bay Area or um, other places that you may have spent time. Uh, and it is not so obvious in those communities that this work is a priority. And we felt particularly as we talked to boards who have so much control over orchestras, and that's another issue, um, that we needed to make the case. And the important thing about this document, very important point about this document, which I really believe in, it's not only about making the moral case, although it does make the moral case, it's about making the case about how diversity and equity, diversity and inclusion enriches us artistically. It's about how teams make better decisions when they're diverse, diverse. It's about how we have to flex as organizations to change, to meet changing demographics, because otherwise our business case won't survive. Um, recognizing that the US by 2045 is a minority, majority minority, minority country with no single racial, um, racially dominant culture. 2040, 2045-ish. So making the case across many, many, uh, many axes, making the case morally, artistically, um, and in terms of business effectiveness, there are so many reasons why we have to do this. Conversations which have not had, have not been had to the degree that we, they should have been had in orchestras. And this was part of that. Okay, so there's a lot of work going on here, and I'm not going to talk about this slide. We have a we have a great group of people at the league who is working on this, and we are trying to put representation everywhere um, in our work we do, and we're trying to support the field. We have over 600 members or orchestras who are members, everything from the biggest orchestra from the Los Angeles Philharmonic, which is the biggest budget orchestra in the country, right down to the tiny regional orchestras. And so our 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 work is to support the field. Uh, and, we, and we have some really great programs. The Catalyst Fund is about putting money um, in the hands of orchestras. This is basically re-granting Mellon, Mellon Foundation money, allowing orchestras to have the discussions because discussions need to happen, allowing them to hire consultants, allowing them to, to think about how to build processes that create change. And the National Alliance for Audition Support, critical program. Um, this is about mentoring, audition preparation, financial support, and also providing a set of audition previews for, uh, mu for musicians of color to, in to increase their ability to get into American orchestras. Just put a little marker down for a discussion that's really important here, which is uh, the question of pipeline. We hear that word, the pipeline. The pipeline is a problem. There's not enough musicians coming, coming through. I personally can't stand the word pipeline, which I think is dehumanizing. But um, there, is, there is a real issue here. I do think there is a problem because we know that the, the lack of privilege in communities of color really has concretely stopped talent from finding its way to a profession. But we also know that there are concrete reasons why the talent that has found its way through has not found its way onto stages of American orchestras. And this program is about that second part. It's about how to make sure that talent finds a way through. So let's talk for a minute before we go on to kind of like some philosophical stuff about the future. Let's talk for a minute about what orchestras are doing. And um, there's a little good news here. Now, of course, this is all happening mid pandemic. Uh, and orchestras are challenged at the deepest level financially about you know, how they reinvent their futures. Uh, but there's, a, there's been a lot of thought at the same time to how we make the most of this opportunity. COVID has been a very, very difficult time for orchestras, but there are also opportunities to come back different, to come back richer, to come back 
um, thinking about our artistic missions in, in new ways. And it has been just extraordinary watching orchestras as they since um, since September, coming back, some of them in some states, Texas, Florida, a few other places, coming back and doing concerts with audiences. Um, many orchestras, something like 60% of orchestras across the country, by the way, it's a lot of orchestras, 60% of 600, uh, you know, orchestras coming back doing some kind of streaming. And I, we don't have data on this, but anecdotally, I will say the degree to which um, we are seeing black composers coming through, we're seeing um, multimedia content, uh, which reflects a new approach to, to diversity and equity. We're seeing the nurturing of emerging composers. We're seeing young instrumentalists coming through and we're seeing some different thinking from surprising places. I mean, a lot, a lot is happening here that gives us reason to be um, encouraged. Now, we also have good reason to be skeptical because we might ask, how, to what degree is this performative? To what degree is it, is it tokenistic? Um, and again, that's where the lead comes in because our work is to make sure that we hold the field to the change and it continues along this track. But here are just a few examples just for the sake of sharing. And I really just picked out some things which has, had jumped out of me. This is about celebrating, you know, black composers of the past. Um, Chevalier de Saint George, Bridge Tower, Coleridge Taylor, Florence Price, of course, a major, major discovery. Um, and some other great names on here. This is the Fall River Symphony Orchestra, which is a small community orchestra in Massachusetts. Here's another one, an absolutely beautiful film produced with the highest of production values by the Winston-Salem Symphony Orchestra. Check it out, it's really, it's really a neat video. Um, so why do I put those first? Well, isn't that interesting? Fall River Symphony Orchestra and Winston-Salem Symphony, not the San Francisco Symphony and the LA Phil, though they are also doing amazing work. But I, pu I put this out to, 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 to point out the degree to which actually thinking differently is actually happening in even the smallest orchestras, uh, the smallest regional orchestras. It's, um, it's encouraging. Let's look at what's happening here. San Francisco Conservatory of Music and San Francisco Symphony announcing Emerging Black Composers Project. Um, and this is just starting up now, but it's a 10 year commissioning partnership. I could also at the same time have dropped in a slide saying, you know, the LA Phil, pointing out that the LA Phil, by the way, has had a long, long commitment to compose of color. The LA Phil's centennial commissions, 50 centennial commissions, something like a third of them were composed of color and almost a half were, were female. So, you know, both the big West Coast orchestras have had shown a remarkable commitment to this work. This is a new project coming out of Cincinnati. It's called Neiman, um, and it's the it's it's targeted at young instrumentalists of color. Um, this is really before they get to the Sphinx competition. This is at a much long, younger age, and it's been um, developed by a consortium in Cincinnati with you know some seed money put in by the Cincinnati Symphony, and it's barely getting started, but it's something that you'll hear more about. And then this is my slide, different thinking from surprising places, like Handel and Haydn Society. It's the oldest orchestra in the US, in case you didn't know. I think it was founded in, I wanna say 1815. Um, and it's mostly an early music orchestra. And yet this early music orchestra um, has actually really found some amazing ways to think about programming. And they've hired Reggie Mobley, who's just a, a really wonderful guy. And David Sneed, who runs the runs Handel and Haydn, is interesting because he used to be the marketing director of the New York Philharmonic. So, if you want to look about look at how an orchestra is thinking very creatively about the audience aspects of this, uh, have a look at them. Very interesting. So, uh, lots of great stuff. And then, lastly, we're seeing these organizational commitments. We're seeing orchestras appoint people in their organization to hold responsibility and accountability. Philadelphia Orchestra has done it, Cincinnati Symphony has done it, others are doing it, which haven't been announced yet. So, you know, that's a quick tour through what's going on, you know, in, in the profession. Um, and I think, you know, cautiously, we can feel optimistic about finally beginning to address some of these inequities which have been going on for so long and which have lain unaddressed for so long.
So I'm going to um, just unshare now, and I'm going to kind of close um, my talk, except I've immediately lost my notes. There we go. I'm just going to kind of close my talk before we go to questions, um, just with a few kind of um, kind of philosophical uh, thoughts about 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 where we are in this interesting and, and complex moment. I think I've said that I feel very strongly about the urgency of this moment. This is the moment where we have to go from incrementalism to action and accountability. Um, and at, at the League of American Orchestras, we, we will be a part of that. And part of that is, is about measurement. You know, that fa famous phrase, uh, you can't manage it if you don't measure it. And we're still lacking the right data. So we are thinking about and quite away from being announced yet, but the idea of how we can do long range tracking, by which I mean five to 10 years about tracking and change, which will be one of the reasons how we can hold the, hold the field to, 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 to real change. The second thing I wanna say is there's an incredible opportunity to change the things we can change now. Changing repertoire, fostering the composers of color of our time, bringing new and different artists on the stage. And as I kind of showed here, it's already happening and it, and it needs to continue to happen. That needs to happen every year, not just this year. But I think we have to recognize that different areas of our work will go at different paces. Um, I mentioned boards earlier. You know, we have a, boards are really, really complicated. Boards of orchestras, often you're talking about the biggest orchestras of American orchestras. 50, 60, 70 people on a board. Um, however, progressive staffs and musicians are in organizations, the boards tend to be more conservative. And in addition to that, we have a complicated relationship between money and power on boards, um, which means that winning the hearts and minds of board members as we create this change is gonna be absolutely vital for us. Then we have a whole discussion about this continuing issue of changing um, challenges on stage. And, you know, let's, let's, you know, we can come back and talk about this, but the issue of auditions is so incredibly complicated. Um, should they be blind? Should they be open? Uh, I have some opinions about that, which there isn't time to go in, into here, but we need to continue to examine that and we need to look at our tenure processes. So there's some obstacles there that we, we are a long way from fixing. And then of course, around audiences. Now, audiences will change when the people on stage change because why would audiences of color want to come to see orchestral concerts if they are faced with a sea of white faces? So changing the representation on change on stage is gonna be absolutely, absolutely critical. But as we change audiences, there are some hard commercial realities about this. Marketing 101, if ever, any of you have done marketing courses, you will know Marketing 101 tells you, you sell to the people who are already converted. As you know, very famous phrase in the classical music business, if you could get every subscriber to come to one extra concert a year, you would solve your financial problems. Well, great, you might solve your financial problems. You're certainly not gonna change, solve the problems of the demographics of your orchestra. So, the people who market concerts are gonna to have to have incentives to change the demographics of their audiences as well as generating revenue. So there's some real complexity around how we create change and, and, and we just have to keep pushing at it and keep pushing at it because it's important. So I'm gonna just finish by, by, by saying one important thing, which is where I come from, um, which is about, uh, and I, I would say it as the kind of joy of diversity and inclusion. There is so much fear about what will be lost, but the, it, but the more we focus on what we gain, on the richness of texture that comes from diversity, of the richness of artistic experience, the more we um, are able to think about building a field that is just so incredibly much more inclusive because it's a field where everybody can be happier. And at, at, at the bottom line, that means something to me. I personally uh, can sleep better at night, could sleep better at night if I thought that the art form was, to, back to where I started with Aaron Flake's quote, if I thought that our art form was, was open and available to everyone who wanted to be enriched by it. Um, and so that's the journey for me. Um, it's about getting to that place, overcoming the barriers, 
um, moving from incrementalism to real change and accountability. And it's a journey that started. That's the good news. And so I'll end it there. And uh, maybe we can move in some questions. It's, um, it's a pleasure to, uh, to hear you speak on, and to see that there is a refreshing change at this moment. And, and I'm going to ask for people to ask questions. And I guess I'll start just to get the ball rolling. Um, racism is a funny thing. Uh, the hierarchical, cultural hierarchy. Uh, there's, a, there's an element of, of, of orchestra performance and orchestral attendance that is hierarchical. Mm -hmm. It's not a friendly situation. There's an audience down in the below the symphony orchestra, and there's there's all kinds of cultural constructs that keep us from Absolutely. accessing the art form, and we are not judging the art form. The art form is gorgeous, but can you address any of this kind of cultural hierarchicalism that has prevented not just people of diversity from entering into this relationship, but people who are alienated by elitism? Uh, we yeah. have similar problems in academia, as you know. UCLA is one of the most sought-after schools in the world. We are an elite institution. So to some degree, that means that we make our brand about keeping people out. And I wonder if you could address any of this elitism and cultural of hierarchicalism then. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it runs so incredibly deep, it's hard to know even where to start. I mean, just look at the design of concert halls. Um, you know, when... Um, it's an interesting point here, but let's let's take Walt Disney Concert Hall. This is a great example. When Walt Disney Concert Hall was built, uh, and Frank Gehry, um, you know who you know I know pretty well, has talks will talk eloquently about this. There are no boxes in Walt Disney Concert Hall. Uh, it, it is a it is, and you know Frank talks about the importance for him of making a hall that feels democratic, um, and in fact. Walt Disney, one of the most remarkable things about that hall is that, this, that actually, although, of course, some people are further than, from the stage than others, actually, the sound is pretty democratic. And if you go back to the very, very last row in Walt Disney Concert Hall, uh, and, you know, I've sat in the very back row of the hall and listened to a string quartet and be kind of blown away by the intimacy of the music making. So Walt Disney Concert Hall is a very, example, a very good example of how architecture, um, you, you know, uh, um, can change things, and it is a it's a it's a hall where you feel the audience is you know the music is in the middle of the audience. It's a very different experience to going to um, you know, let's say Chicago Symphony Hall. It's a very good example. It's a wonderful hall, of course, and it's an amazing orchestra. The hall is actually deliberately constructed to be elite with the, with the boxes around. Carnegie Hall is another one. Carnegie Hall is a you know the, th think about the two rows of boxes in Carnegie Hall. It's, it, you know, elitism is enshrined in, 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 and privilege is enshrined in the design of the hall. So those are things that are not going to be overcome easily um, because I don't, you know, I don't see us not playing in Carnegie Hall or in Chicago Symphony Hall anytime soon. But one of the things that I think we have to do better is we have to notice them. Uh, and, and I'll give you another little example about elitism. One is a pet peeve of mine, um, and it's to, to do with program notes, is the amount of assumptions that we make in program. We don't even realize how we push people away from our art form by the way we write. And I have a, I have a little exercise of like taking a program note and like going down and underlining all the words that are alienating. Like, you know, like if I see the word recapitulation, I'm like, really? Like, okay, I know what that means, but what does that, does that really help us bring audiences in? Who actually is this, is this program though for? Um, and so the, and one, of the, one of the problems about writing about music and the way we talk about music and the way we present it is we, we don't notice it. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll give you another example of these sort of assumptions that we don't notice. We populate our concerts, concert stages with great artists. And we talk about them as if we assume the whole world knows who they are. But actually the whole world, other than a small handful of musicians, you know, the Yo-Yo Mars and the Winter Marsalises and the you know, other great artists of our time, other than a small number of great artists, most people don't know about the artists who they're coming to hear. And yet we continue to talk about them making assumptions that people are insiders. And so, so there's a lot of, there's, there's so much that we do that we don't notice. And so, so my response to you about that, Arturo, is I think we've got a lot of change to do, but we have to start by trying to notice better what we do that pushes people away. 
you're on mute. Of course. Oh, I knew that. I knew that. I was just testing you. Um, I think it's a great answer. And I think the, what immediately comes to mind is El Philharmonie, Phil, El Philharmonie in, in, uh, in Germany. And, I've not and been the in construction, it. it's a beautiful hall. And it's, the construction of this hall is inviting and it's acoustically designed. So everybody gets to hear very clearly. And I think that is a way of welcoming people. We have really a, a great need for, for all of you to participate. This is a wonderful opportunity to ask this gentleman important questions about where we're going in the American symphony world. Uh, there's a question here. What changes would you like to see in the training of musicians in conservatories and school of music? Oh, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, so uh, look, I, I, I'm not an, an expert on this. I will say a couple of things. First of all, there has been some consistent talk about how the orchestral field, the performance, performing arts world, and the um, conservatory world needs to be better aligned. Um, and uh, Dean Strempel and I have talked about that on, on, on a number of occasions. Um, and there's, there's a, a lot of um, thought happening right now, but for me, the biggest change is about preparing, and this is not only about, this is by the way, not only about you know, race and equity, this is a much more generic question, which is about preparing musicians for the profession they're going to go into. So, you know, if you, you know, the, the violin studio, which is only preparing students to play the, the Beethoven and the Brahms and the Sibelius concerto, and then the musician finds themselves in a profession where they're required to, be able to speak to audiences, to be public advocates, to be entrepreneurs, to manage their own recordings, to manage their own social media, um, to um, you know, to think about um, to think about um, commissioning composers. It's a it's a totally different world out there, and I'm not gonna. I don't know enough about what's going on on at UCLA, and I frankly don't know enough about what's going on in a lot of colleges to be able to know how much is and is is not happening. But the, the, the comment to be underlined here is conservatories have to prepare the, 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 the prepare musicians for the, for the profession that exists today and the profession that will exist tomorrow. It's like the old Wayne Gretzky thing about like I skate to where the puck is, right? You know, that, 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 you know, conservatories have to be preparing for what the conservatory is going to look like in what conservatories have to be preparing people for what the profession is going to look like in 20 years. And it's going to be way different to even what it is now, not from 20 years previously. Big complex topic. That's one of the things we deal with every day. What makes a complete trained, educated musician and how do we uh, change uh, some of our curriculum so it, it prepares students for the real world and prepares them to be uh, well-versed in a glo or more global approach to making music. Because I think that will also be uh, very workable on the concert stage. Hello, Simon. Thank you for speaking today for UCLA and our community. Can you talk a bit more about the blind audition process? You touched on this. I'd like to hear more. We're working through this at LACO too. I'd love to. So this is a very, very important issue. So the Sphinx uh, National Alliance for Audition Support just came out with a series of guidelines about this. And um, so we're trying to create change here. And the guidelines, and I, I'm going to talk very candidly here about about what I see as some of the ch some of the challenges. So the guidelines um, have a number of recommendations and there are a lot of really good recommendations, but there are two things which really stand out in the guidelines. And these are guidelines that are now currently being discussed by American orchestras. This is the this is the the discussion that's going on right now. One of the guidelines says auditions should be blind through to the final round. And the other guideline says past the final round, there should be an interview round at which the, um, the full candidate should be assessed. So I think it's true to say that if you speak to most orchestral musicians of, of color, they will tell you that they want to be judged on, this, on, on, a, on a level playing field with white musicians. And they will tell you that this recommendation to have a blind auditions through the final round. The Metropolitan Opera Orchestra is one of the few orchestras that has done that. Goodness knows what will happen in the future about that. That's another story. But the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra is, is one of the few orchestras that has had that practice of keeping the screen up right through the final round. Um, 
so a lot of musicians of color will tell you that's what they want because they want to be judged on an equal, on an equal platform. And that's partly what's coming out through the Sphinx recommendation. I will tell you personally that I struggle with it because I worry that we won't go fast enough. And, and I keep asking the question, I keep asking the following question. First of all, if you look back at the last 20 years and you see how we've changed the gender diversity of American orchestras and see how blind, and that's been very heavily due to, to blind auditions, right? Is, is changing the diversity, of, changing the gender parity of American orchestras. And I see how much that has failed to, to change the, the ethnic representation, the racial rec representation of American orchestras. I really wonder what's going to be different in the future if we make it even more blind. That's one thing. The, the other question I keep asking, and I've never had a good answer to this yet, is like, why, why, is, why are orchestras different? Like in every other, in, well, maybe not every, but in most other areas of life, I as an employer can make an intentional choice to diversify my, my workforce. I can say, I have two fabulous candidates for a job here, and I'm going to choose to diversify my workforce. And I'm troubled by the fact that these guidelines don't let us do that. So I, I still have unanswered questions about it. I really, I really honor the, 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 the lived experience and voices of musicians of color who say we should keep the, keep the screen up. I just hope it works and I hope it goes fast enough. So I think it's an incredibly problematic, incredibly problematic area. It's, 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 you know, probably if you want to read about, if you want to read something about this, the Anthony Tomasini article in the New York Times for about six months ago, maybe a little longer, was a, was a pivotal moment. A lot of people, that made a lot of people very angry on both sides, on both sides. Um, so it's, it's, it's unclear where this is going to land. Um, it may end up, actually they're not being substantive change for the minute because there is some some unclarity about it but it's 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 complicated i'm glad i'm glad you brought up the metropolitan orchestra there's a bit of a row about the uh the agreement that has been reached with the management there and uh extending their payment reducing their uh coverage and uh there's a lot of there's a lot of economic reality that i think plays into this uh this is a great question what is the impact of audition repertoire in relationship to the musical canon taught in the university there have been discussions about how we can make the musical canon in higher education more inclusive however a big issue seems to be that the music that students study in conservatories and schools of music are based on audition repertoire orchestral or otherwise which often reinforces traditional ideas of the musical canon yeah, so um, that is definitely true. And audition repertoire is really highly prescriptive. I mean, if you're a, you know, if you're a bass player and you're going to an audition, you all know this better than I do. You're going to go, you're going to play a set number of excerpts, and they're going to be basically the same for every audition. Um, so yes, there's been very little change change there. And yes, I think it would be fabulous to have a much broader uh, body of um, uh, repertoire. Um, for people to, to, to come on audition with, because let's look at it this way. If I'm a musician of color and I come to audition an orchestra and the first thing I do is I'm confronted with an entirely white canon, like how does that make me feel in terms of inclusion? So I think there's a really, there's a real culture issue that we have to um, think about, you know, you know, very, you know, very, very deeply there. But I'd say that the, the even bigger picture is about the canon period. And we could spend the next two hours talking about that. Um, the, you know, what's great is the way the canon has been, is, is being refreshed right now. And we're seeing different composers come through. We're seeing you know, the, the absolute rehabilitation of amazing voices like Florence Price that we never even knew. And um, this is really important, um, but we have to be able, one of the things I think there's a real dilemma for us, and I know that this is something that a lot of musicians think about, we have to be able to hold the contradictions and we have to be able to live with them. We have to be able to take a both and approach this. We have to be able to say, yes, we need to bring through this great repertoire that we haven't heard about. Yes, we need to nurture and, and, and um, bring through amazing composers of color of our time. Yes, we need to mix the repertoire so that audiences get a much richer texture of experience. And yes, at the same time, we also need to look after this extraordinary body of work which we are entrusted to, our Louvre Museum and our Metropolitan Museum. And there is a bit of an either or 
going on in the profession about this right now. And I, and I think we just have to sit with that and, and be able to say that, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll put myself in this picture. You know, I grew up on the classics, right? I virtually, a day doesn't go by when I don't go to the piano and play a Bach prelude and fugue. So, you know, those, those are, you know, the, the experience of Brahms and Bruckner symphonies and Schubert chamber music and uh, is, is absolutely core to my own musical experience. And I never want to see that music uh, lose its 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 value and its just precious richness of spiritual experience for us. But I want this other change to happen as well. And I think being able to hold both of those things together is complicated because they tend to be they tend to be regarded as a trade, and I don't like that. We have to be in both places. I I mean it's, it's interesting to me that this question borders on the economics of survival as well. Winning a tenured orchestra position remains by far an unmatched luxury economically speaking for many orchestral performance majors. There are simply no better options for aspiring classical musicians to guarantee a safe future, start a family, build a life. Unfortunately, the audition repertoire is incredibly old fashioned and reactionary. Any advice, reaction, how likely the repertoire of auditions could be changed to reflect the new reality? Um, Not gonna happen. So let's go back to my, my, my phrase before, you know, changing hearts and minds of, of, of boards. We also have to change hearts and minds of orchestra, of, of orchestra musicians and, and, and committees. Because remember, I just want to remind everybody that in most American orchestras, the audition process and the, rep the audition process is bargained. It's part of the contract. It's not something where management says this is the process. It is a bargained element of the contract. So in other words, um, managements don't have a right individually to say, we're going to just unilaterally change the way we do auditions, change the repertoire. We have to win hearts and minds. So we have to win the hearts and minds of, of, of the musicians. And this is where conservatories come in is so important because as you are training musicians to the, for the next generation, uh, you're going to see a different generation of musicians come into those positions, into orchestra committees and audition committees and tenure committees who have a different view and, 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 and they will be the people who will be able to create change. So, uh, you know, I think that we, we've got some work to do to, to persuade everybody that it is the right thing to do. Um, but I think it goes right along hand in hand with this issue about the, 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 the way we approach the canon. I, I, I you know, I want to uh, kind of, take a second and say to all of us, I, we really enjoyed so much of what you've had to share and it's been eye-opening on every level. Um, nothing we didn't know, similar to the problems that we face in academia, but I wanted to remind myself, because this is how you began your talk today, is that we need to examine our lives and our hearts and see where we are. Racism doesn't just pop out of nowhere. It's, a, it's an acculturated thing. And we have racism in the locker room of the symphony orchestra. We have racism yeah. in the boardroom. We have racism on the podium. We have racism and we don't, and, and, and until we fundamentally examine why we have racism in our locker rooms, in our boardrooms and in our uh, podiums, we're, we're really not gonna understand the nature of the problem. And you've been very conscientious and thoughtful about your approach to this. And so um, I think there's a lot of, of things. There's one more question I'd love to hear you answer because it's just, it, it's kind of it hits at the root of the culture of racism that we experience in every uh, level of orchestral life. And this is uh, getting more non-white musicians on stage will not happen overnight. In the meantime, how do we create a sense, and this is key, and you, sh you hit on this before, how do we create a sense of belonging within the concert hall for people of color who attend? Um, we have to change the things that we can change now. We have to change them now. We have to think about pricing, about the equity of pricing, and about and about what are the economic barriers to people to come. We have to think about um, it's and it's not only by the way concert halls. You know, there's a whole big thing going on right now about how how orchestras are doing absolutely amazing work putting digital content out. But let's just pause for a moment and think about inequity of access to broadband in this country, particularly. You know, in LA, you can get broad, broadband pretty much you know, well everywhere, but, but in every part of LA, not so sure. Um, what about rural areas? 
Definitely not so sure. So there's an equity built into digital distribution as well as physical distribution. So, but we have to change the things we can. We have to change the repertoire. We have to consistently remind ourselves that, that, that um, you know, every time we don't put diversity in front of people, whether it's in a brochure, whether it's in um, a selection of composers, every time we don't do that, it's a fail. And, and, and so we, we you know, just got to stay on that point. We have to change the things we can. We have to change the way ushers think about welcoming people. Now, great usher, again, I'm sorry I'm using the LA example, but I know it's because you all know that. Usher pool at the LA Phil Music Center, great, super diverse, great group of people, very welcoming. I really love that. Volunteer ushers, Midwestern cities, does that feel welcoming? Don't know, question mark. And so, so again, how might we change the, the sense of welcome? Um, how might we um, do things about the way we talk about the music? You know, the way we, this, this question about, you know, uh, how we push people away unintentionally by doing stuff that we don't even notice. So the noticing better, the making intentional change, changing the things we can. I agree totally with the comment. It's not the changing the musicians on stage is probably the thing that is actually going to take the longest. In the meantime, we can diversify our boards. We can change the repertoire. We can, we can, we can welcome people in. We can, um, you know, by the way, we didn't even talk about this, but we can think about what is the relationship between community building and audience development. We think about audience development and we say, we're going to do a concert about the, um, uh, Latino community and we're going to market it to the Latino community and we're going to hope they come. Do we actually think about what it would mean to precede that by the building of authentic dialogue and relationship with that Latino community? Mostly not. And there's another whole big discussion there about, about community and its relationship to authentic dialogue. So, so that when you actually are trying to sell tickets, people actually do feel, to your point, Arturo, they are, do feel that they're welcomed in because you are interested as, a, as an organization in them for more than their credit card. That's incredibly well said. The, what you're talking about is citizenry, civic alliance, yeah. and actually caring about the communities. Yes, and it, yes, it can, and and, and it, absolutely, and 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 we we won't change, um, we won't significantly change the makeup of audiences. In order to change the makeup of audiences, we have to do all of these things about the way we talk about it, the way we program, so. But we also have to come at it from the other side with building authentic relationships with communities. Well, it's been a privilege to spend time with you. We've learned so much, and um, we are in it for the long haul. We're here to change the, the, the situation alongside you, to co-labor with you, to see the concert hall, the civic community, the conservatory model, all of it needs to change. And we uh, stand by you, UCLA, Herb Albert School of Music stands uh, by you and, and agrees and affirms and, and, and says, yes, you're, you're absolutely speaking the right language. And we thank you for the time that you've spent with us. Uh, before we go, I wanna remind people that this is a still waiting series. We've had uh, incredible, um, speakers uh, like Simon Woods and Michelle Brown and Cornell West. And uh, we are having another wonderful opportunity to meet Dr. Israel Butler, the chair of the music department in North Carolina Central University, who is a, a, a key part of creating a, 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 a racist action committee of their own at Eastman, although on a much, much more nuanced level than we've been able to so far, but we will. And we have so much to learn from Dr. Israel Butler. And uh, we just invite you to join us on Thursday, April 15th, again, from 3 to 4.30 p.m. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate all of your questions. I wish we could get to all of them, but it's been an incredible time uh, that we've been able to share with Simon Woods. So thank you for attending this talk and we'll, 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 uh, we'll be back soon. Take care. Thanks, Arturo. Thanks to you all. Thank you, Simon.